الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد المصطفى صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين الغر الميمين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to our show dear beloved uh, viewers respected uh, brothers and sisters uh, Inshallah, uh, for tonight's uh, show, I'll be your host Ali Burji and uh, with us uh, we've got a guest who doesn't really need uh, much introduction, he's quite known uh, through Imam Hussein TV, none other but Sayyid Muhsin Shah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa Thank you for having me again. <laughs> well, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, it's, it's an honour to have you Sayyidna with us. <laughs> Inshallah, uh, we're going to continue today's program uh, with regards to the Islamic seminaries, uh, otherwise known as the Hausa. Uh, we've uh, got into the Hausa uh, during our, in our previous um, program. We explained what the Hausa is, religious studies, yeah, where um, brothers and sisters can attend to enrich their knowledge and understanding of Islam and the uh, Islamic sciences. Now, inshallah, I would like to further continue our discussion today. And uh, we would like to firstly discuss with regards to who is more suitable of uh, attending or enrolling in Hausa. Ahsan. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you, Mr. Burji, for having me. Shukr lillah. Who does Hausa uh, suit and what sort of yeah. person, what sort of student is ideal for the Hausa. Character, mindset. Hausa is not easy. And the level when I entered the Hausa, when I started to study, if I compare it to Western academia, the level is at uh, A level towards your first year of a degree. So there's a lot of, lot of information. There's a lot, a lot of detail. Very, very mature information and mature detail. So one who has an academic background and an academic background of critically analyzing um, content would really, really suit Hausa. Now, what do I mean by critically analyzing? That means English literature, history, law, um, maybe uh, psychology and mainly philosophy where you have ideas and arguments which you can critique and you could analyze, you could argue against or argue for and go back and forth to come to a conclusion. People of this background, the Hosel really, really suits. Simply because they can sit and they can analyze texts and they can scrutinize it and to gain knowledge and to gain uh, the correct understanding and the correct answer using traditional evidences of the Hadith and the Quran. So a student of this uh, caliber with these experiences and these skills would really, really suit the Hausa. But don't want to discourage anybody else from going to the Hausa because there are other uh, sciences and fields of, of um, subjects which could benefit people who are, come from uh, an arithmetic background, people who come from a scientific background, people who come from, um, I don't know the correct terminology for it, but let's say, you know, a vocal background. So, if I was to give examples, someone who comes from an arithmetic background would really, really enjoy sarf and nahu. Because these are formulas that are used to uh, conjugate words. So, it would, they c learn the different patterns and styles that you will get verbs, adjectives, uh, nouns in. And they would, they would learn these patterns and then whatever uh, we call it like you know the master the the, the 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 original word has and they can start to form different types of words from the original three letter word so some of the arithmetic would really really benefit uh, and really really enjoy a subject like that so just to stop you there sorry um because the uh, question uh, came up why do they emphasize so much in grammar arabic grammar in hausa it is arabic grammar now first of all the Hosea syllabus um, 
has been going on for hundreds of years. And Sarf and Nahu was taught to make sure that the Arabs, well, I shouldn't say the Arabs, just the students. Sarf and Nahu was taught to make sure the students had the basic understanding or actually an uh, intermediate understanding of Arabic grammar so that when they were presented with texts they understood what role each word had to play in the sentence. Uh, with the text you mean for example the holy verses from the Quran and or all of them. narrations? All of them. Okay. Whether it was the holy Quran, whether it was hadith, whether it was Najul Balagha, whether it was uh, works by our great scholars such as al al Haili. Uh, you know, Rama uh, Majlisi, Sheikh Tosi, Sheikh Mufid. Well, when we study their works, we need to understand the Arabic that was used at that time, which was Fasih, and how that style of Arabic um, was to be read and understood. And it is only with Sarf and Nahu that we can understand this. Now, to break it down for the viewers at home, if you want to understand why Sarf and Nahu is so important, if you look at the way wudu is performed in the Shia school of thought and in other schools of thought from the Quranic ayah, this is all down to Sarf and Nahu, especially Nahu, where the word plays in a sentence and ref is referred to which verb. In this case, you have the maf'ul bi, which is the defeat, and then they have the verb. The verb, is it wiping or is it washing? Now, inshallah, your brothers and sisters can go back to the verse and then they can look it up and they can see uh, where the word plays in the sentence and what verb does it refer back to. Um, with uh, regards to, back again to suitability for how is our studying. Now, you, you mentioned um, certain uh, groups of people who would be very um, beneficial for the Hawza. Um Now, if someone didn't have um, those skills, it, would it still uh, be a reason for them not to attend? Is it something no, they can no, pick up so, on the way? So the, the only people that I would discourage to go to Hawza are those people who have um, given up on everything and they just... Actually, to be honest, even them, those, those individuals who have tried different subjects and different fields uh, of, of, of studying, whether it will be the arts or the sciences, um, and have given up on everything and thought, oh, I might as well do Islamic sciences, Islamic studies yeah. to gain some thawab. Um, I mean, even those people benefit from Hausa. Everyone benefits from Hausa. So I don't even want to discourage... It all starts from the intention as well. Why Indeed. do you go to Hausa? Well, Indeed. first thing that I would think is that, firstly, before you even want to think of, um, you know, getting into a profession or helping the community, is for you to understand Islam. Yeah? There's so many subjects in Hawza, Islamic sciences, um, that widen and broaden your understanding, that it actually increases your Iman as well, your belief, your understanding, it strengthens you as a human being. And obviously, when, once you put that in practice, then it's uh, quite obvious for other people as well to see, and it, it will attract attention, positive atten attention. Definitely, definitely. I mean, um, I mean, people have different intentions to join the house. Some of them, it is uh, family honor and, and carrying a tradition, as in they come from a family of scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, we have many famous families, mashallah. We have like, you know, the Shirazi family, the, uh, the Hakim family, um, you know, the Qazwinis, the Mudarsis. You know, these, these, these people are, are families who invested not just time, but generations into the Hawza and into the developing the sciences. Um, we also have, um, you know, um, people who join the Hawza because they want to benefit their community and they feel that they have a very influential role in the mosque. Maybe they looked up to and, and they, they inspire a lot of young people and that it is wise for this person to go to the Hawza, you know, to gain knowledge and help continue to influence and guide and motivate the youth and, and the community. And there are others who do it for, you know, the sincerity of pleasuring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are those who do it for the sheer love of the religion of Islam and, and, and studying that knowledge and the sheer love of the knowledge that Islam has to provide. So there are many reasons, um, you know, for, for going to Hawza uh, and to develop your understanding of the Islamic sciences. But I, I think 
I can't tell you off the top of my head, and I can't even. I've never asked what is. Uh, I never asked my teachers what is the, the the best of the intentions in regards to going to Hausa. But I assume that realistically, wouldn't it first thing be to seek closeness to Allah Subhanahu? I would assume it would be that that is to seek closeness to Allah Subhanahu. And then Allah. after that, draw others closer to Allah Subhanahu. Inshallah. Inshallah, that that should, according to my humble opinion, that should be a number one intention. Indeed, uh, indeed. In if one. not, then obviously it is to serve the Imam of our time. Allahumma for, for he is the the true Hausa Deen. <laughs> yeah. Inshallah. Inshallah. Now, um, with regards to Hausa and politics, <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to bring it up because a lot of people discuss about it. Of course, others that have been in Hausa may have their own experiences. I just wanted to know your opinion with regards to these two um, subjects. Uh, do they go hand in hand? Do politics and Hausa go hand in hand? If they do, should they? Um, I'll tell you the answer I'm supposed to tell you. And I'll tell you the real answer. The answer I'm supposed to tell you is that no, 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 these are just things people say and rumours and is nothing but the truth is that there are individuals who are politically uh, driven now politics may be a small scale between different houses or a big scale when it comes to different ideologies or even or different maraja mm. we cannot ignore that there are some individuals who are influenced by these sort of um, propaganda and these sort of campaigns and get involved in the house it shouldn't be the case uh, the Hausa should be a place for anyone to come and learn and should, regardless of their background, their pol political alliance and what marja they follow. There's no need to get these involved in the Hausa. You go to your lessons, you learn your, you go through your books, you listen to your teacher and inshallah you pass the exam and you go on and, and so forth. Um, the question is, is that um, does it get political? Sometimes it does. My best advice to you to anyone that's going to Hausa is to keep your eyes and ears open uh, not to get involved but to understand what's going on and why it's going on how though how could you help someone for understand example, for example without mentioning names and without mm -hmm. mentioning uh, the topics there are certain subjects that are not taught in Najaf but are taught in Qom so why are they not taught in Najaf is there something wrong when you ask the scholars some of the scholars say it is haram to study these topics Mm. So what about those who are studying this topic? And what, what, why is Qum teaching it if Najaf are not teaching it? Now to the rest of the world, to keep the peace and to keep the balance and to keep the unity, people will say, oh no, it's not like this, it's not like that, everyone's fine. But I understand that and I respect that. And yes, they, they definitely, 100% there should be unity under the Walaya of Amir al All Shia should be united under this, regardless of, of their beliefs and regardless of their yeah. uh, you know, maraja or the political background 100%. or their aqaid it does, that doesn't matter the main is the wulai of Amir al-Mu'mineen but academically we are allowed to come and discuss that why is Najaf not teaching this subject academically tell us what, why is why, why have the certain scholars have deemed this as haram are you aware if someone actually sat down and discussed this um, are you aware am I aware we have in my house we did discuss this that why, you know, as within our circles, with our teachers, we asked, why did Fulan say this about this subject, uh, this, this science? Why, mm -hmm. why is it not, uh, you know, why, why, why is he deemed it as haram? And he said that this is his respected, the respected scholar, and this is his respected opinion. Proofs were provided? Or? Definitely, definitely. This is his opinion based on, uh, you know, evidence A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is why the other houses teach it based on evidence A, B, and C. It's just a difference of opinion. We don't need to get involved in, in, in siding that, oh no, we, we don't need to become takfiri and say that these guys are off this is wrong, this is... We don't need to get involved That's in that. That's ignorance, yeah. Yeah, well, what we can do is, you know, to be uh, wary and to understand the dynamics and the situation. And then furthermore, to go f uh, forth if you want to study it or not to study it, but understand that there are differences of opinion and that you need to understand why there's a difference of opinion and keep that in mind when studying the topic. Good. So basically, everyone should take everything in the beginning with a pinch of salt. And definitely, obviously, investigate. Definitely. The, the, the worst thing you could do for any student is to go into the Hausa 
and believe that everything that you're being taught and everything is is the word of God and is you know uh, is a hundred percent authentic and accurate. Mm. If it's not from the Quran and if it's not from you know a hadith. Then of the Ahlul Bayt, then there's no there's no need to go in with that much that oh no this is what I was taught this is 100 percent correct because there are difference of opinion and different matters. you will be taught what you are taught you won't be exposed to what else is available until you progress when you progress then you'll be you know you can start studying other other teachers who have other opinions and then you can yourself you know derive your own understanding and choose your own path after that. And also understand that um, one of the big benefits uh, our school of thought has is that one of its main doctrines is to question everything. Definitely. Yeah, not take uh, anything blindly and just absorb it. And uh, I experienced it as well. Uh, and it, it shows that when you encourage your brothers and sisters to question everything, that means that at the end of the day, your intention is to seek the truth and not just sway left and right. And that's what I like about our madhab. Unfortunately, I don't see it in every uh, madhab, uh, in every sect. To be honest, you, you won't even see it in every house, unfortunately. Well, but that's the thing. I don't have the experience. I haven't been <laughs> to too many houses. But uh, in Najaf, from what I know, um, uh, we were encouraged and are encouraged to question everything. The only thing we don't question with regards to the um, uh, religious rulings, jurisprudence. Okay. Yes, and yes, that's yes. only because, for example, uh, that you follow certain rulings. Now you can later on um, move on to higher level education and how was and acquire knowledge and get some understanding uh, of certain rulings and why they were put in place. But some can't really be explained. And that's why we were told as well that inshallah when Imam Zaman reappears Allah for Jal Sharif, he could explain everything clearly. Definitely, um, definitely. I mean the, the main thing is this is that a lot of people don't have the skills and the requirements to understand what we call istidlal, how a law is derived. Uh, there's a long process of looking at the Quranic ayah, looking at all the hadith, looking at the ijma, uh, looking at the aql, what makes logical sense. Um, I'm talking to you to understand this, you know, how can you use the aql when you haven't studied logic? It doesn't make sense, you know, for someone who hasn't studied mantiq, how can, how can we t explain to them how the aql has been implemented here in this, in this fatwa? Also another interesting point with regards to intellect and logic, yeah? I always thought that logic is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just, you know, um, um, created us with. So we were born, we are raised and logic is fixed set. <laughs> in our mind, but I found out that it's actually not the case. Uh, you need to calibrate that logic, and Indeed. if if someone teaches you um, to think in a certain way, which is incorrect, you will think is correct, but in reality, it's incorrect. Definitely, and that's what was very Definitely. interesting. I mean, the famous saying is uh, "common sense is not that common," and uh, if we all had the same, you know, strong logic, then we'd all be driving on the same side of the road. <laughs> True. <laughs> we're not, unfortunately. That's, that's true. Inshallah, I said now we're just going to um, stop for a short break. And uh, dear viewers, uh, please uh, do stay with us. We'll be right back, inshallah. <laughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back, uh, beloved uh, brothers and sisters, respected viewers. Uh, you are watching us uh, on Imam Hussein TV. Uh, our show is T3 Teach, Talk and Thrive, inshallah. Um, just uh, before our short break, uh, we were discussing with Sayyid Muhsin Shah with regards to Hawza. Mm -hmm. And um, inshallah, we wanted to further on discuss about uh, um, Hawza in general. Uh, how um, is the establishment funded? Ah, uh, excellent. A good question. Um, traditionally, what happened was that all the maraja that collect khums, mm -hmm. they would distribute a portion of that um, to the hausa, and that money would be used for, um, you know, for maintenance. It will be used for books and and uh, stationery. Uh, it will be used for shahriya that will be given to the students. And I remember my cousins, both of my cousins studied in Qum, in uh, Hujjatiya they studied. 
um, and they would tell me that they would receive shahriya from more than one marja. So it was like all the maraja would collect and put it all in one pot. Um, their, you could say, their um, portion of the homes that they're going to donate towards um, the Hawza. And a student, a talib al would receive shahriya from more than one marja. So it's like there was a there was a source of community, a source of um, you know networking and a committee where everyone put into the pot and everyone would benefit from the pot. Um, this is how the house is is uh, you know maintained and this is how it's financed. And also obviously there are donors, people who comment obviously uh, and and donate directly to the house. Um, maybe those students who have mashallah after the house have gone and done well financially would would come back and also donate. To, you know, uh, certain money for certain um, you know, materials and stuff for the Hausa. So it was mainly on donations and Khums money is mainly was uh, funding the Hausa. I remember back in the day um, there was uh, this incident where the Iraqi government wanted to um, actually fund the uh, houses in um, Najaf in Karbala. Yes. And the uh, Grand Ayatollahs uh, rejected this mm -hmm. offer. Now, why do you think they would reject aid from the government? That's a really good question. A good, a wise friend of mine, a good friend of mine, always told he told me that whoever pays the bills is the boss. So, if the government start to fund the Hausa, the government are paying the bills. So now the government becomes they would be able to push their agendas superior. Or, yeah. Mm. So. What it is is that if the government started to fund the Hausa, they start to get a foot into the Hausa and they start to influence the Hausa and push their own. Whether that agenda. being positive or negative. Whatever. And at that time, me and you both know, that would have been a very detrimental and it would have been a negative effect on the Hausa. Even now, I think, me personally, um, none other but the um, scholars should, should have a say in the Hausa. And I think that it's quite. Um, wise not to allow any um, foreign bodies such as a, a I think the most, the most important government. thing the most important thing in the Hausa is that the only people that should have a power of influence are the Maraja or those qualified that the opinion is, is valid I mean you're not going to listen to uh, those people who haven't really studied political sciences on how to run you know run politics and run, run a country um, nor would you take advice of of a tailor uh, about how to about a car and 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 you know, what's, how to you know sure. um, maintain and, and how to manage your car. It doesn't make sense. Same thing with the Hausa. Only those with authority and those with the knowledge should be the ones that advise and influence the Hausa to go to benefit the community and benefit the students and benefit the Ummah, inshallah. Ah, santum. Now, with regards to um, um, followers of uh, Ahlul Bayt who uh, are attending the houses, what, what um, potential is there for them? Let's say once they felt that they've completed, even though uh, we both know that uh, Hausa is never really... Um, <laughs> Mashallah. So you can't really... Complete house yeah. studies. Mm -hmm. Subhanallah, the the knowledge so is what, so what, vast. I think what majority of people do, and what we recommend, is that they finish the muqaddimat and satuh. So once you've completed those, you can only do it in about four years, three years, four years it takes. Once you've completed that, um, a lot of people have got the strong foundations um, to go and if they wanted to, to start to do tabliq and to start to help in the community. A lot of these people aren't ready to become leaders of communities and, and, and resident alim um, because they don't have a, have a mature uh, mind. So if you, if you think about it, the youngest age that the Hausa really accepts is like 18 year olds. And then they go to study for four years, five years, they come back 22, 23. And now they're going to lead a community which are mainly made up of um, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 year olds. It's, it's, it's not wise. And, and also the, that child, that child, that student hasn't really um, gained enough knowledge in terms of fiqh and counselling and also uh, to, to help benefit the community in society, in social aspects, um, as well as aspects to do with, like you say, mental health or 
um, domestic issues and uh, things like that. So it's really it's really important that someone who just finished the Hawza doesn't go straight into uh, leading a community. But what is available is that you can help your community with, with certain workshops. You can go and, and start lecturing about what you've learnt. Um, the Hawza doesn't also teach you what to tell people, but it teaches you how to go and learn and gain more knowledge. Where to look for knowledge, in what books and in, in, in what um, um, different avenues to actually go and extract knowledge to form a lecture or to form a workshop or to form even a book to go and do some research and to write a journal or an essay or a short pamphlet this the Hawza will teach you and pro provide you with these skills so there's m a lot of opportunities for you to go and benefit and help your community and also there's a lot of opportunities to do further study um, to study in the Hawza for four years you will walk away with something which is equivalent to like a bachelor's degree um, yeah, do they give you something in paper? Definitely, 100%, 100%, 100%. This is very important that uh, whenever you go to a house that you get your transcripts, so like your, your exams that you've taken and, and, and your uh, marks. Um, once you complete the studies, sometimes if you're, there's an imama ceremony where uh, the, the head of the house will come and put an imama on your head, uh, which you've uh, rightly uh, you know, earned. Um, some give you an imama on the first day. <laughs> yeah, I would like actually to expand a bit on that, just to give me your thoughts. Because I, 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 did, I did experience it uh, firsthand. I did see certain students would come, uh, from, uh, not all schools except that, yeah? Some are strict, some... It depends as well, the, 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 the... I wouldn't say philosophy or the idea behind, yeah. behind it. Now, I, I, I saw, for example, a Hausa. Uh, if I could mention, let's say it's a stand, it's Hausa in Najaf, it's quite strict, yeah? So it's mandatory to uh, finish off your muqaddimat, yeah? And uh, you take uh, Lujan exams, okay? These are basically exams recognized by all th uh, the uh, authorities who are running okay, the Hausa so, okay, in so Najaf. Once yeah. that is done, you can get some certification just to prove yes. that you've been here, you've studied with this uh, person, mm -hmm. You've, uh, you've been approved by um, this marja, yes. et cetera, et cetera. And eventually, as you've mentioned, there'll be a uh, imama ceremony. Now, other houses would uh, put on uh, imama on just a student who just walked in. Yeah. Um, now, when I asked me, myself, when I asked uh, as to why, they said that this could help encourage the students by wearing the imama to feel the... Um, the responsibility, the way uh, of the responsibility, uh, the importance of it, and it helps them uh, keep the momentum in their studies. Now, my personal uh, observation in Najaf was that this is, it comes down to personality. Some may take it the wrong way, yeah? Uh, I think uh, if a mature, wise person would uh, wear the imama from the get-go, first of all, a lot of pupils might refuse, yeah? Because it's quite a big responsibility. Because my, my belief is that once you wear the imama, you're leaving, breathing, walking Islam, yeah? So every single thing you say and do represents Islam, which is very important, and that's why lots of times we get all these controversial problems left and right because of random people walking around pretending to be knowledgeable. Now, how could this be improved in the Hausa? Like, how could you stop this cultural thing of, let's say, wearing the imama on someone who's not qualified and if he's abusing? Because, for example, in Najaf, yeah, you are very respected for being a pupil in Hausa. Without even knowing your capabilities, your, your knowledge, you're respected just from being a student. And when you were the imama, you're even more respected as a scholar. And it, it does have, it's like a double-edged sword, unfortunately. Some people take advantage of it, yeah? Um, do you think there would be a way to amend this problem so it doesn't occur? Um, the best uh, possible answer I could give you is that uh, a man's behavior is based on his own intention and his own characteristics. The imama 
The reason that they give it on the first day um, is because to wear the imamah is the sunnah of the of Rasulullah and the sunnah of the Ahlul Bayt. <laughs> to wear an imamah. It is mustahab to wear an imamah in prayer, even for non-students. Yes. So, so the believers, the ummah, are encouraged to wear imamahs when they go to pray and even to have the hanak. It is it's mustahab. However, today, um, it is seen as if that those who are qualified were the imam and those who are qualified, they are um, the ones who have finished their studies and qualified, they are the ones to wear it. As if like when you go to, uh, you do a degree mm. uh, here in the West and then you have your graduation, you get the gown and you get the hat. Imagine you got that from the get-go. You just start walking exactly, around Exactly, you uni. start walking around on your, on your first day in university with the gown and the hat. You see, but so it's different, obviously. It's obviously it's different, it's different because th this is the tradition of the Ahlul Bayt. Um, so I, I can understand people who have uh, frustrations and have issues with this that you shouldn't give it on the first day and I can understand those who actually do give it on the first day because it's mustahab I think it comes down to the individual to make a sensible and mature choice and that once wearing it, once you're in uniform that you have to conduct yourself in a certain manner which is deemed acceptable for what we call Ahl al or you know Talib al now, also uh, speaking of that, with regards to students in Hausa, um, there is a certain dress code. Yes. Uh, there are certain expectations from the students. If we can go through them. The dress code. For, um, the students are not allowed to wear Western clothing. Yes. In, in Najaf. In, in, in certain Hausa in Najaf, yeah, they won't yeah. be allowed. They have to wear. Uh, they have to uh, wear this Dishtasha, Dishtasha, Yeah. Uh, the traditional. Abba and Abba, I believe. Okay, and that that the reason is because it just uh, for our it is, respect it is, of it's, it's, it is it is the uniform uh, for for the student. It is taken from the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt and of Rasulullah, mm. and it is in a way deemed as your um, professional idea attire. For example, you have the distasha or the qamis, which is like a shirt. Then you have the qaba, which is like the blazer, mm. and the ba'aba on top out of tradition, out of respect, and out of honor. So it's similar to the schools here. You can't go to a school with a t shirt in the West. You have to wear a shirt, and you have to wear a tie, and a blazer. That's just the high school that I went to. There were certain high schools that didn't have that, they had like sweatshirts and, some, uh, and trousers. And th those high schools weren't seemed as prestigious or seemed as uh, you know as as worthy of sending your children to simply because they didn't have a smart uniform. Not to this, this uh, not to say that that, that high school didn't um, you know uh, gain good results from their pupils and that the teaching uh, you know wasn't wasn't bad. Of course, it was good. I'm sure many students went to that school and got a fantastic education. But parents were, you know, reluctant to send their children to that school because of the uniform that they weren't wearing a shirt and a blazer. Same with the Hausa, you know, there is certain uh, criteria required and a student must dress appropriately. I know in some houses you're not allowed to have short sleeve uh, shirts. Um, you, you have to wear trousers, you're not even allowed to wear jogging bottoms. Um, certain houses will say uh, certain rules where you know you can't even be barefoot. You have to have socks on at all times. So you know th there is a akhlaq behind the dress code, and and there is a sort of tradition that is being carried on and passed on. Uh, even in our houses, we were taught that uh, when you when you further if you when you graduate when you go on further, to to refrain from wearing certain clothing, and to make sure that you're always like this. And they even said that you will never see even the US president dress like this or use these sort of um, garments to wear. And they said, try and find, you know, try and Google it and try and find them. See if they ever wear something like this, they'll never wear it. And there's a reason behind it. Mm. And it's to do with the akhlaq of dressing. Okay, keep a, a, a certain image as well. Indeed. Now, um, other expectations and the rules within houses as well, not to eat or drink in public. Yes. <laughs> now, I'd like, obviously, for the sake of uh, understanding for uh, our viewers um, as to why is has been that rule placed in Hausa. I, I can't tell you 
because uh, I don't even know why that rule has been placed. But I assume that it's on the it is on the direction of that people have um, weird eating habits, and that you know if you were to see a sheikh or a, you know a talib al trying to drink out of a straw, you know, uh, and, and 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 he's making certain faces, this is deemed inappropriate, and it could he could be made uh, a mockery of. And he so basically, his. not to avoid any belittling of himself. Definitely, you know, if 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 they were to see, you know, if, if we were to see a sheikh getting, you know, a burger or something, and there's sauce coming down his beard and it's on his uh, qaba, you know, it, it doesn't give a good image. So, okay. but I mean, you can still learn how to drink and eat in public. I hope, I hope so. I definitely hope so. Um, I just would like to share with you and our viewers with regards to what I was told in Najaf. The reason why students uh, should refrain from eating and drinking in public is again comes down to akhlaq mannerisms yes. as was the sunnah of the holy prophet sallallahu that if he had food and he was going to eat in public he'd first offer it to everyone mm -hmm. so he wouldn't never ever sit and eat on his own yeah, on mm -hmm. his own also another reason is because uh, in iraq obviously there's a lot of poverty Indeed. yeah and it's quite bad both uh, as uh, an image and uh, I would say spiritually as well uh, or consciously knowing that there's poor people in the street who might not uh, afford to eat mm -hmm. and they're looking at a scholar eating kebab or something yes, you know, it's, it's no, kebab it's is a luxury in Iraq yeah um, so th those are really the reasons I, I, I was told as to why students uh, refrain from eating and drinking now obviously um, that doesn't mean that wherever you are, if you're not home or in the house or facilities, you can't eat and drink. Um, there are certain windows, for example, you can walk into a restaurant and go into a room. Yes. Yeah. Sit down with uh, your brothers and or sisters and, you know, obviously with the sisters only. <laughs> yeah. Real um, sisters. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, or mahram siblings. Sisters. Yeah. Siblings. Um, so I, I understand it and I respect it. Yeah. And... To be honest with you, um, I do like how Hausa is maintained and I'm happy that there's certain ideologies and way of thinking and culture that has been kept um, just makes me feel more comfortable and at ease that the message, inshallah, is still uh, intact, um, psychologically maybe, I don't know. Um, now, uh, unfortunately, uh, we're running out of time. This time could either be a blessing or a curse, but when it comes to shows, it, sometimes it's <laughs> mostly it mostly like a curse. Yeah, we run out of time and we got so many things to cover. So, inshallah, the um, last um, topic I'd like to um, approach with you is with regards to any brothers and sisters who wish to attend Hausa, but for any reason, whether personal, financial, um, health reason, they they're not able to attend Hausa, whether it be in the, their own uh, country or uh, attend abroad in Iraq, Iran, Syria, wherever Hausa is available. For those who wish to attend Hausa and can't for whatever reason, um, don't think that that's the end of, of your Islamic journey and le of learning. Hausa is very, very simple. It is a book. You study the book, you give an exam on that book and then you get the next book. So you start off, for example, fiqh, you start off with the Rasala Amalia of Amarja. You finish that, you give exams on that, then they will give you Tabsar Muta'allameen by Alam Al-Hilli, which is like a Rasala Amalia of, of 800 years ago, uh, which discusses so much more. You go through that, you give an exam on it, then you go on to fiqh istitlal. Um, I was taught by the ones by Bakr Irwani, I was taught those ones. So. It's, that's what Hosa is. You get a book, you study it, you give the exam, you but go to the next level. You can't really study by yourself, can you? Definitely not. So it's you very need a guide. You need to get a, a teacher, and the best teachers are the shayukh and the uh, the muammimin, the sayyids that have been to Hosa, who have studied very, very uh, hard and for a very, very long time, and that have covered these books. It it is more than acceptable for you to go to a sheikh in his country. Go to the sheikh and say, Sheikh, no, I have an interest in history. Can you give me a history book to read? And can you examine me on it? And he, at the end of the examination, can actually write you a reference letter to say that 
you know, Fulan studied under me, this book, I examined him, I, and, and I passed him with this mark, with his signature, and if he has a ring with a stamp, he can stamp it. If he has any link to any Hawza, and, any, and as, is recognized as, as, you know, as, as a teacher, that is valid. And, and when you go to Hawza, if you show that recommendation letter, you won't have to take that quarter, that module. It will be accepted that, yes, you have covered this module. And once you've done that book, you can go on to the next book. So if you want to learn, uh, you know, um, Quranic sciences, you study a book on Quranic sciences, you give the exam, then you go to the next one, a, a bit more advanced. And then you study that one and you give a, um, a, a, an exam on that. The, the, most, the easiest ones and the ones that are attainable to the public, it will be either fiqh or aqaid. So, you know, with, with fiqh, you have the Rasal Amaliyah. Obviously, the fiqh, Amaliyah. realistically, fiqh and aqaid should be priority. Definitely, but, and, and they're the most available. So for fiqh, for example, we studied um, uh, theological instructions. Uh, after that, we went on to uh, Bab al-Hadi Ashar. And then after that, we went on to Divine Justice. That was in my house. And then different houses will have different books. But you see, you start off with one level, then you go to the next level, then on to the next level, and so forth. Mantik says Sadiq Sharazi, may Allah prolong his life, has a great book on introductory um, you know, uh, lessons to Mantik. And Are they available from, in English? That one is available in English, yes. Okay, you can good. get that in English. Uh, and it's, it's very good. And even our teachers have recommended it to us. That uh, if you want, if it's your first time studying Mantik, this book is, is really, really good. And it's really, so it breaks really it down for someone who definite. is not really into uh, Mantik or is not related has no clue, to... clue, because Mantik, for, for someone new, it can be a bit daunting. And there's all these a bit, new... a bit. <laughs> you have all these new definitions. And then, yeah. um, you know, you, you're, you're learning how to analyze a sentence and to gain the maximum knowledge from that sentence. And the Mashallah says Sadiq has a, has a beautiful book that our teachers recommended to us. Uh, also said Muhammad Shirazi has books on Aqaid that were taught in my house. So it was really, really nice, um, you know, that, that um, they didn't, you know, restrict uh, to Arabic, but allowed English as well into that and help us develop. So for those who don't uh, want to go to Hawza but can't do, go to your, your sheikh and just ask them, um, you know, if you have an ayatollah in, in the area, that's even better. You know, the, the ayatollah's recommendation it will be 100% accepted. So if you were to study certain books, not even study, you study them yourselves, but the ayatollah took your exam. He wrote the exam and you took it and he passed you, um, you know, he marked it and, and he gave you a grade. And he writes that letter that I examined him and I, you know this is the grade I gave him and, and he stamps it and, and signs it off. That letter will 100% be, be worthy in, in, in any house that you attend. Okay, that's good. So there's always uh, a way when the will is... Definitely, perfect. and also, let's not forget, there's also online courses, there's also uh, YouTube videos, there's also... Yeah. Uh, there used to be DVDs and video cassettes before of different lessons that you could learn and take exams of uh, for, for Hausa. Um, you know, okay. subjects and housing lessons. So there's a lot available. You need to get involved with your local center, with the sheikh or with an ayatollah and, and, and ask them that, look, what is available? I can't go to Najif, I can't go to Karbala, I can't go to Qom Mashid. Um, what is available here for me to gain knowledge and to, to, to progress in Islamic uh, sciences? Um, and they will definitely be able to help you. If not, contact Imam Hussein TV. And we would definitely be able to do something for you. Inshallah. Inshallah. Hassanatum Sayyidina. Uh, Inshallah, if you'd like to conclude, share anything else with uh, Definitely, I would, I would definitely viewers. encourage all those that uh, please go to the house if you can. Um, and, and if you can't go to the house, then definitely find out what books that they teach. Try and get yourself, uh, you know, the first level of the Muqaddimat books. And to study and to learn and, and, and to further, further gain. And the best advice I'll, I'll give you is this. In the first year of Hawza, uh, once you finish the first year, when you go to a majlis, you start to understand what topics the the um, dhaka, the lecture is uh, the the Muhammad is talking about. In the second year, you will understand what he's saying and where he got his sources from. In the third year, you'll be able to correct his mistakes. Like that's how advanced you are. So by the third year of your hausa, when you're sitting in the front of a lecture and he's speaking, you'll be able to correct his mistakes. So that's Inshallah. that's how uh, intense. That's how deep. The knowledge goes uh, in, in, in Hawza And that's just three years it takes For you to, to sit down and listen to a lecture And be able to circle the mistakes And then shall imagine with 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th year What we'll be able to accomplish So definitely for all those who haven't been to the Hawza Inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Give you the opportunity 
to go and study. Me. If not, then definitely try and, and, and increase your uh, education and your understanding of Islam and the Islamic sciences. And inshallah, we pray for Mr. Burji that he returns to Najaf one day, inshallah, to continue his studies. Najaf Kufa, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. With that being said, I uh, would like to thank you all for uh, watching our show. Hope uh, that it's been as beneficial to yourselves as it has been for us. Uh, unfortunately, we've reached to the end. I uh, would like to um, ask you all to remember us in your du'as, the team who are making all this uh, possible for us. And also never uh, forget uh, to pray for the hastening of the reappearance of Imam Al-Mahdi Ta'ala Faraj Al-Sharif. And uh, inshallah, we'll see you next time. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tayyibin wa al-tahirin. Mm-hmm.